So I'm going to begin with an introduction to our first speaker, uh, Edith Decker Phillips. Uh, uh, Edith is visiting us from her home in Germany. She is author of Pike Video, translated into uh, English and published by Station Hill Press. And I remember when I first heard about uh, Edith from Nam June, and he gave me a copy of her dissertation on Nam June's life, and uh, it was then uh, published by Dumont Verlag in Germany. And it was and remains the best book on uh, Nam June Pike. Its research and detail and the issues it uncovers are really uh, unmatched and will be uh, a key source for continuing research uh, into his life. She's also a superb curator, uh, contributing to many uh, exhibitions, including the landmark video sculpture 1989 exhibition, and the catalog of which is, a, again, a terrific resource. Um, Edith will be collaborating with myself and Greg Zinman on a new edition of Nam June's uh, collected writings. And uh, so, without further ado, let me welcome Edith Decker Phillips, title of her talk, A Music to TV. Buddha. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm really grateful that I can be here. I came from Germany to talk about the, the early German years of Namjoon Paik. Get rid of my stuff. Okay. Well, I will read, because otherwise it's not my language, I'm lost. Nam Paik came to Germany in 1956. He was 24 years old and had graduated at the University of Tokyo with a thesis on Arnold Schoenberg. He continued his studies at the universities of Munich, later Freiburg. He was interested in European culture, in music and art history, philosophy, and the music of the 20th century. He had a solid knowledge of composing music. When he left Germany seven years later, he was a member of the Fluxus movement and was internationally known as a cultural terrorist. I would like to start at the very beginning with a letter to Wolfgang Steinecke. You see it here, you cannot really read it. It's of course in a very bad German. Um, I have extracted the quotation you can see in German as well as in English from about the middle, but it doesn't really matter, I read it. Namjoon Paik wrote it in December 1958. A few months before, he had met John Cage for the first time at the International Summer Course for New Music in Darmstadt. In his letter, he is proposing his developing own composition, Homage à Mr. John Cage, so, and he hoped it could be performed in Darmstadt the following year, 1959. In this letter, he gives a condensed formula of his aim and ambition. Arnold Schoenberg had written atonal music, meaning music avoiding traditional harmonies. John Cage had written a composition in the way that he employed chance in writing music and not his own taste and will. The young Namjoon Paik was now going to write music, music that was anything else than written music and was more like theater. Steinecke denied what Paik proposed. He didn't let him perform in Darmstadt. For the director of this avant-garde music workshop, it sounded too wild as Paik was talking about motorbikes and other strange things. Significantly, this first composition, Hommage à John Cage, the Mr. was dropped, was performed at the Gallery 22 in Düsseldorf. What was meant as a first presentation in the field of avant-garde music found only a place at an art gallery. Before Paik himself could know, his creative activities had found its destination. 
The following years, he lived in Cologne, where composers of new music like Karlheinz Stockhausen worked at the electronic studio of the radio station WDR. The young composer Paik didn't manage to get into the electronic studio. He only worked in his own studio with tape recorders and different electronic equipment. He met young artists like Mary Bauermeister and got into cycles of artists who were interested in performance. The new thing among performing artists was named Neo Dada, or from 1960 on Fluxus, due to its founder George Michunas. The first performances under the name Fluxus took place in the town Wiesbaden near Frankfurt. Paik fitted into this new movement perfectly. There were artists from different countries. It was really international, and it had a lot to do with music. Colleagues like George Michunas, Alice Knowles, George Brecht, or Dick Higgins performed actions that were often playful and made fun of traditional music and art. Paik's early performances were more radical more aggressive, and more revolting against the structures and instruments of classical music. His so-called action music started with homage to John Cage in 1959 and ended already in 1962 with pieces like one for violin solo where he smashes a violin. Paik's action music attacked literally musical instruments and the holy traditions of European classical music. But those values he wanted to destroy were as well his own values. Paik was trained in Western music and philosophy, and he had come to Germany to study them more thoroughly. Fighting against the world of serious music was a way to free himself and to find out what his personal contribution might be. Nam John Paik has stressed again and again that it was John Cage who influenced him the most. In the li late 1950s, Paik took up his techniques like the prepared piano, or he was likewise convinced that any sound could be music. But this kind of Cajun influence is only traceable in the relatively short period of action music. Later performance pieces or the video work show different aspects that can be related to Paik. Uh, sorry, uh, John Cage. I should look. During the 1950s, John Cage was well known among the music avant-garde in Europe and in Korea and Japan. Paik was eager to meet him. Only he was very suspicious about Cage's turn towards Zen Buddhism. Daisetsu Taitaro Suzuki was teaching Zen in the US at that time, and John Cage had learned with Suzuki. In Paik's opinion, Suzuki was selling out Eastern culture. Paik doubted very much that Americans could deal with Buddhism profoundly and found it ridiculous that someone like Cage was talking about Zen. But when he actually listened to John Cage's lecture in Darmstadt in 1958, he changed his mind. He said that he was thinking cynical in the beginning. But during the lecture, he got turned on. And after the lecture, he was a completely different person. I think John Cage indirectly not only encouraged Paige to become more radical in his performance pieces that followed, but much further, he encouraged him to rely openly on his own origin and heritage. Sound objects he made in his Cologne studio got the title Zen for Touching, 1961. The performance he carried out in 1962 is called Zen for Head. In 1963, he made Vox for Zen and Instruments for Zen Exercise. You would find numerous titles of that period that enclosed the work then. We have a new image. So that's the poster of this first exhibition. Paik's video works start in 1963 with exhibition of music, electronic television. 
this now famous show and historical starting point of video art took place in the house of Rolf Jährling in Wuppertal. Jährling was an architect, but since 1949, he ran a gallery besides. His gallery Parnasse was showing abstract art alternating with the most daring young artists. For his show, Pei captured not only the gallery space, but the entire house, including the bathtub and the toilet. The objects and installation he presented addressed all senses, including smell. In front of the entrance to the house, there was hanging the head of a freshly slaughtered cow. It had to be passed first and was, of course, a most shocking element. It is not surprising that critics writing about his show paid more attention to the cow head than Peck had intended. Surprising is rather that his, this head of a milk cow was often called something else, for instance, skull of a bull. We have the proverb of slaughtering holy cows, which means the breaking up with highly valued traditions or taboos. The head of a slaughtered cow was not more than an entrance motto, like see the holy traditions of European music have been slaughtered for this exhibition. In the context of this Gallery Panas exhibition, I further only want to refer to the 12 or 13 altered TV sets. They were presented in a separate room, and two of these prepared TV sets were broken when they arrived. The one that was just dead, he turned to the ground face down. The other broken down TV showed only one single line in the middle. So we see that soon. This is, well, that's the normal picture, because in Germany at that time, uh, TV started after 8 o'clock p.m. So, um, and it, yeah, and, uh, that was dark already. So we even see an artist, Thomas Schmidt, he was very young then and he had to help to install it. So Peck didn't want to give the broken down TV up. So he put it on its side and gave it the title Zen for TV. The artist saw the positive potential of his failure. In the end, it was the only TV set with a title. Zen for TV, originally merely an accident, advanced to a work that has been shown again and again and that is as popular as TV Buddha. Talking about Peck's video works includes necessarily reflecting the technical background of it. Nowadays, TV sets with a tube look quite vintage. During the 1960s, they were state of art, and Peck invented new ways dealing with their electronics. What had happened to Zen for TV accidentally was later done for purpose. By taking out magnet coils, the cathode ray gun could not write the image over the entire screen. It was only moving sideways, and drawing a line of light this way. It has been said that the vertical line symbolizes the sudden enlightenment that one can experience through meditation. I may add that the time concept of Zen Buddhism is reflected here, which says that there only is the very moment that we exist in. Since we only live in the very moment, we should be aware of this moment. We cannot go back in time or go forward into the future, not even for a second. There is no duration of time in this concept, only moment after moment. The moment is the only reality we have. Anything else is illusion. The moment in Buddhist understanding can last three seconds. For technical reasons, is the moment of Zen for TV's line even shorter than three seconds? In other words, the line shows a timeless moment.
Stand for TV is the first of a number of video works that are closely related to Asian thinking and philosophy. The second well-known work in this context is the TV Buddha, which was first shown in 1974. TV Buddha is an installation that includes a video camera and a monitor, like Zen for TV is a piece that wasn't actually planned, but came into existence by a spontaneous reaction. Paik had his fourth show of electronic art at the Gallery Bonino in New York City. When everything was in place, there was an empty wall left. At home he had an antique Buddha statue that he had bought to sell sometime later for a higher price. He brought it into the gallery and set it up with a camera and a monitor. The camera filmed the statue from the front so that the Buddha was watching himself on the monitor. TV Buddha, which became an icon for the artist himself, was born. Okay, I didn't say some one thing I did want to say in the beginning. So when I now, now refer to the Whitney show, um, it was um, the, the first large scale one man um, exhibition of Nam June's work. Uh, and it was curated by John Hanhart. A lot has been said and written about his closed circuit installation, TV Buddha. But as well you can tell by it how deep and profound Paik's insight in Zen Buddhism was. Putting away irony and humor, is this Buddha not watching television and he's not watching himself doing something? It is rather a metaphor for Zen, Zen meditation as such, where you avoid looking at something and where you try to avoid following your thoughts. Your aim during meditation is to get to the bottom of pure existence and being. You look into yourself in order to find something that goes far beyond it. Only in this metaphorical meaning, TV Buddha is looking at himself. Paik has created a number of closed circuit installations. All of these installations have in common that a camera is transmitting its live images onto a monitor or a video protection. The first one of this kind was TV chair in 1968. These installations play with the notion of reality and its mediated image. This includes as well a time concept since the camera image appears instantly on screen. Or in fact, there is a slight time difference because of the signal transmission, only this is imperceptible for our eyes. So rather than time concepts, is it the confrontation of real things with their own mediated image, what closed circuit installations can provide best? Another example of this work group is Real Plant, Live Plant, conceived in 1978 and shown at the Whitney exhibition in 1982. An old Philco television is filled up with dirt. The flowers coming out of the top are filmed by the camera. A tiny monitor behind the screen is showing the live image. The real plant and the live plant are part of one single object. In terms of contact, Tent, the live image mirrors the state of the flowers which were in decay when the photo was taken. Uh, let's look at the other one. I think the flowers are a little bit fresher uh, that day. So that's, that's a view from the Whitney exhibition with this uh, pyramid in the corner. My favorite example is real fish, live fish also of 1982 in the Whitney show Next to Real Plant Live Plan. We see a real fish tank and an old Philco television. In front of it, there's the filming camera. To the right, there's another Philco television showing what the camera is filming. Here we can imagine how close real and live can get. When we focus on the likeliness of real and live, 
we understand that Pei created artworks that can be seen as well as comments on the reality that is shown on TV. The mediated image of broadcast television is maybe live, but it's never real. But it's not the media aspect I'm following today. It is Peik's inherent oriental thinking and his inclusion of Zen Buddhist themes. As much as Peik always has been interested in the development of electronic media in the latest technical progress, his feet were on the ground and one strong reference was nature. In the afternoon of his exhibition of music electronic television, he wrote in 1964, my TV is not always interesting, but not always uninteresting, as nature, who, is beautiful, not because it changes beautifully, but because it simply changes. Twelve years later, in the text Input Time and Output Time of 1976, it reads like this. Video art imitates nature, not in its appearance or mass, but in its intimate time structure, which is the process of aging, a certain kind of irreversibility. Closed circuit installations especially provide the means of bringing in nature in a direct and lively form. In 1989, after Paik had created large-scale installations with hundreds of monitors, he designed a very different installation for the Porticus in Frankfurt. The Porticus is a small exhibition space, at that time run by Caspar Koenig, being in Frankfurt as the head of the local art school. So later he was in Cologne at the museum. So as minimal art was Koenig's personal preference, Peck tried to make it as minimal as possible. Finally, it became a single candle that was filmed by one video camera. The overwhelming presence of this one candle came as a result of the video projectors that cast their images onto the walls. The video projectors of that time had three colored tubes each. Putting them out of proper calibration they would not show the correct signal, but three images, one in red, one in blue, and one in green. The technical process of one candle enables us to celebrate the burning down of this ancient source of light. The candle, a little thing that could be completely overlooked, forces its audience to stand in awe and watch its burning down. The transmitted live image helps the real thing by extreme enlargement to be perceived in a new way. Rather than an exhibit, we can describe one candle as a space of worship. If you think the closed circuit installation of one candle is technically too demanding for your home, you can try as well the much simpler object TV candle of 1975. You only need an empty case and a candle in order to have the full pleasure of watching. I hope I could show that the references to Zen Buddhism in Namjoon Paik's work are not a superficial ornament and not a matter of public relation. Selling Zen Buddhism and Oriental thinking was not his aim but rather it was his original thinking and cultural background. It is not contradictory that he created large-scale installations and always explored the latest available technical possibilities. Exactly this is the great capital of his heritage and which makes his work so rich and interesting. Peck's ambition was to establish video as a great contemporary art form if possible, the greatest of all. For sure, he developed and employed electronic media for people and not for art's sake. Thank you.